The Science Museum Group has many, many, many coffee-related objects in its collection. But where did this connection between science and coffee begin? During the 17th and 18th centuries, Europe was experiencing a period of research and discovery, and centres of discussion sprung up in a surprising place, the coffee house. But where did these come from? The earliest accounts of coffee houses are in records of Mecca and Cairo in the 1510s, and coffee drinking percolated through to Europe in the 16th century and eventually to England. Oxford saw England's first coffee house, the Angel, open in around 1650. European coffee supplies first came through the Levant Company from cultivators in Yemen, but it didn't take long for colonial powers like the English, French and Dutch to bring coffee production to their colonies in Indonesia, South America and the Caribbean. The British coffee cultivation in Jamaica relied on slave labour, and the 18th century was the height of the slave trade. Coffee was still very much a luxury item, a stark contrast to how it was considered a poor man's crop in the British colonised Caribbean. It turns out that coffee shops have always been social spaces, but back in 18th century England, there was more business taking place in them than catch-ups and caffeine fixes. Try to order an iced caramel soy latte with extra cinnamon, and you'd have been met with a blank look. The coffee of the time was a bitter recipe, as thick as puddle water, and so ugly in colour and taste that it was compared to the poisonous waters of the river Styx in the underworld. London's first coffee house was nothing more than a stall opened in an alleyway in 1652, marked by the sign of its namesake, Pasca Rosé's head. Without numbered street systems in place, you would have found your way around by looking out for shop signs, and the trade cards of businesses gave descriptions of the images these signs bore. Blue plaques around Cornhill in the City of London commemorate the locations of some of these establishments. It took less than 25 years for over 3,000 coffee houses to be registered in cities and towns across the country. They were so popular that new establishments were still opening during the height of the Great Plague in London in the 1660s. The only limit to entry was a fee, leading them to be known as penny universities, where all kinds of people could debate on an equal or equal-ish footing. For the first time, your ordinary citizen could access the latest news and gossip for himself, rather than relying on a wider network to share it. Although groups like the Royal Society originated simply from people meeting, these clubs would have been exclusive to their members, who were still formed from the upper class. On the other hand, Almost anyone could walk into a coffee house and engage in discussion without the same exclusivity. Whether women were permitted to join this discourse is unclear. Without the same social rights as men, their voices are missing from the sources. We know that women owned businesses at the time, some coffee houses, but their inclusion into the world of science was off to a slow start. In fact, at the time, science was not science as we know it today. The Western study of natural philosophy encompassed many disciplines that were all focused on understanding more about the physical world and its phenomena. As meeting places, coffee houses operated similarly to taverns and alehouses, places to socialise, eat, and even receive letters while the postal service was still in its infancy. Unlike other establishments, however, coffee houses didn't sell alcohol meaning their sober patrons were able to hold rational conversations and exchange knowledge about culture and science. They were the place to read the latest pamphlets and broadsheets, though, as a completely unsupervised news outlet, you may have wanted to fact-check to make sure what you were hearing or reading about was actually true. Organisations that last until today, such as Lloyd's of London, were formed out of coffee houses, which provided the perfect place to meet and conduct business before purpose-built office buildings were common. The character of a coffee house was influenced by its patrons, their political affiliations and professions. The Grecian coffee house was a favourite of Royal Society members such as Isaac Newton, and it was there that a group continued their discussions following the dissection of a dolphin at the Society in 1712. Robert Hooke was also known to frequent coffee houses. As a polymath, who was known for contributions in areas ranging from astronomy to microscopic studies, the coffee house would have been a vital sounding board for him to bounce new ideas off his intellectual peers. Coffee house discussion was often portrayed negatively by broadsheet writers, compared to the babble and chatter of women at a gossiping. More than one of their critics described them as like Noah's Ark, receiving animals of every sort, and the erosion of class barriers they afforded wasn't seen as a good thing by everyone. 
In spite of this, they became more than just discussion spaces, turning into venues for lectures or places to sell scientific instruments and hold auctions. One would think a space that encouraged citizens to be sober would be praised, but this wasn't exactly the case. It was the Restoration Era. The monarchy had just been reinstated following the Puritan movement, and the strict rules against revelry had been relaxed. Drinking in taverns was totally normal. No one saw the sober coffee house goers as sensible. Rather, they were suspicious of establishments that stopped people from partaking in the traditional English pastime of getting drunk. Could they harbour Puritan sympathisers? Politics would have been a common topic of discussion in coffee houses, both local affairs and the affairs of the wider world. All this talk of politics had King Charles II worried that coffee wasn't the only thing brewing in these spaces. He thought that the wide-ranging debates found in coffee houses might encourage the spread of views and opinions that would turn people against his authority. Perhaps understandable, given that his father had been executed and he had been exiled. He issued a proclamation attempting to suppress them in 1675. It lasted less than two weeks. Similar attempts to prohibit consumption and activity occurred in the 16th century Ottoman Empire, but these were equally resisted. The public had spoken and they wanted coffee. Actually, it was the spaces that coffee houses had become that were so valued. It's just as well that they survived, for the sake of science as well as for caffeine. Well-known writers of the time, like Addison and Steele, carefully curated their portrayal of coffeehouses as civil and polite, but it's more likely that they were busy and boisterous sites of discussion. It's hard to know exactly which scientific ideas came out of coffeehouses, but it's clear that these spaces were an important new forum for science, particularly in the world city that London was fast becoming. Almost 400 years since they first landed in Britain, coffee shops are still a staple of our society. In the same way, their inhabitants remain immensely varied. You might not be able to dissect a dolphin in your local coffee shop, and please don't, but who knows what breakthrough you might have over your next cup of coffee. Subscribe for more, and to find out about all the coffee-related items in our collection, check out our website, which is linked below.